ready to get those surgical scrubs on. We're going deep into minimally invasive surgery today. Always exciting. We've been pouring over this surgical podcast, Advances in Minimally Invasive Surgery. Fancy title. Right. And optimizing patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. And honestly, <laughs> it's packed with insights. It's a hot topic. Everyone wants surgery to be easier, right? Absolutely. And that's what's so fascinating about minimally invasive stuff. It's not just for surgeons. It's about what the patient experiences. Huge quality of life difference. Exactly. So the podcast, they kept coming back to how laparoscopic surgery stacks up against traditional open surgery. Mm -hmm. Smaller incisions, faster healing. Less pain. Yeah, all the good stuff. But let's be real. Is it really that great? It is tempting for a reason, you know. It's not just hype, smaller right. incisions, way less trauma for your body to deal with. Recovery time can be cut in half LF compared to open Seriously. surgery. Seriously. And less pain means less reliance on heavy meds, faster return to normal activity, plus fewer complications like infections. Win-win. Shorter hospital stay too, right? Yeah. Exactly. Better for the patient, better for the healthcare system overall. But you're right. Surgery has its unpredictable moments. That's what makes me nervous. Yeah. What about when complications crop up during laparoscopy? Like, say, unexpected bleeding. You're in tight spaces, tiny instruments. You'd think it'd be a nightmare, but surgeons have tricks up their sleeves. One way is, they can actually increase the pressure inside the abdomen a bit. Wait, really? Yeah. It's like gently inflating a balloon, helps compress the area, control the bleeding, and gives a clearer view. They also use electric cautery. Like to cauterize blood vessels. Exactly. Or they've got specialized tools for even more precision clips. Or this thing called a harmonic scalpel. It uses ultrasonic vibrations. Ultrasonic. Sounds fancy, right? Yeah. And to cut so A and D seals the tissue at the same time. Wow. I can see why that'd be a game changer for this kind of surgery. But the podcast also made it clear laparoscopy isn't C for everyone. One size fits all, never in medicine. Right. So who's a good candidate and who might need a different approach? Well, if someone's got severe blood clotting problems, an unstable heart rate, those are red flags, and a history of major abdominal surgery, especially if there are. Adhesions. You got it. <laughs> Adhesions make everything tricky. You're like internal scar tissue, right? Exactly. Binding organs together, making it tough to operate, especially <laughs> in laparoscopic colorectal surgery where the anatomy is intricate to begin with. It's mind boggling what surgeons can do laparoscopically. Speaking of pushing boundaries, the podcast got into robotic-assisted surgery. Now you're talking cutting edge. It does sound futuristic. Is this the next big thing? It's got huge GE potential. Robotic systems take minimally invasive to a whole new level. Imagine operating with tiny robotic hands, more precise than humanly possible. Like something out of a movie. What are the big wins? Precision, for one. And that 3D visualization is incredible. Especially helpful for things like prostatectomies or hysterectomies, where precision is key. Makes sense. Less risk, faster recovery. But I'm guessing there's a but coming. There's always a but. Cost is a big one. These systems are pricey. And surgeons need specialized training, which isn't quick or easy. Plus, honestly, sometimes the benefits over regular laparoscopy are minimal. So it's not a magic bullet, more like another tool in the toolbox. Exactly. It all comes down to what's best for the individual patient. Makes sense. Now, about those adhesions, the podcast emphasized how tough they make laparoscopic surgery. How do surgeons even start when a patient has a history of them? It's a puzzle, for sure. They have to be extra cautious. They might use a different entry point for the laparoscope, try to avoid those sticky areas. So strategy comes in even before the first cut. Oh, absolutely. They'll study the patient's surgical history might even use imaging beforehand to get a sense of the lay of the land. Yeah. During surgery, specialized instruments to carefully dissect any adhesions, minimizing the risk to nearby organs. And if it's just too risky? Patient safety comes first. If the adhesions are too severe, they might have to switch to open surgery. Better safe than sorry, as they say. Okay, switching gears a bit. The podcast also compared laparoscopic and open hernia repair. Sounds like laparoscopy usually has the edge. Often, yeah. Quick recovery, less pain. Hmm, who would want that? But again, it's not always cut and dry. The type of hernia, the size, the location. So a big, complicated hernia might still mean open surgery. Exactly. Surgeons weigh everything the patient's history, the hernia itself. It's about personalized care, not a one-size-fits-all approach. Love that. Now, for something a little different, intraoperative cholangiography. Say that three times fast. Right. Sounds intimidating. What even is it? I promise it's not as scary as it sounds. Imagine this, you're having your gallbladder out, 
laparoscopically, and the surgeon wants to make sure your bile ducts are A-OK. Important, but how do they do that? That's where this comes in. They inject a special dye that shows up bright as day on x-rays. It's like giving them a roadmap of your bile ducts so they can spot any blockages or problems. Like a GPS for surgeons. Exactly. It's super helpful, especially if someone's had jaundice, pancreatitis, or gallbladder issues before. They can fix problems right then and there. Amazing how technology lets them be so precise, so proactive. Okay, shifting gears again. Let's talk enhanced recovery after surgery, or ERAS. This is a big one. It's totally changing how we approach surgery as a whole. Okay, tell me more, because the name alone is intriguing. It's not just about what happens in the operating room anymore. It's about the entire patient journey, before, during, after. So making every stage smoother and faster. Exactly. Imagine this. You're prepped for surgery, minimal fasting beforehand, after. You're up and moving sooner, preventing complications. Pain management is proactive, using different types of medications to target different types of pain. So less reliance on strong painkillers. Often, yes. It's called a multimodal approach. Fewer side effects, faster recovery. Sounds much more patient-centered, not just focused on the surgery itself. And here's the best part. ERAS and minimally invasive techniques, they go hand in hand, both about minimizing impact, speeding up recovery. A match made in surgical heaven. I love it. It's like healthcare is moving towards this more integrated, patient-focused model. Which is what we want, right? Absolutely. Now, we've covered a lot of ground, but there's so much more to this minimally invasive world. Up next, we'll look at how surgeons adapt their techniques for different patients. After all, everybody's different. And those differences matter. We'll be diving into how they approach laparoscopy for obese patients, making sure it's both safe and effective. Stay tuned as we continue our deep dive into minimally invasive surgery. So, obese patients undergoing laparoscopy, that's got to come with its own set of considerations, right? It's not just about the steps of the surgery itself. It's about adapting to each person's anatomy. Right, because everyone's built differently. Exactly. With obese patients, surgeons might need to use longer instruments, adjust the table positioning, things like that. So it's doable, it just takes some extra finesse. But ultimately, it means obese patients can still reap the benefits of minimally invasive surgery. Absolutely. If anything, the benefits are even more pronounced for them. Smaller incisions, lower risk of wound infections, which can be a bigger concern, plus that faster recovery time means getting back to their lives sooner. Makes a world of difference. Speaking of things that can throw a wrench in the works, the podcast also mentions something called port site hernias. Not the most common complication, but definitely something to be aware of. I'll admit I hadn't heard of it before. Break it down for me. What are we talking about here? So you've got those small incisions, the ports, where they put the instruments in. Right, okay? like little doorways. Exactly. Well, sometimes a hernia can actually form at one of those port sites. A hernia? You mean where part of the intestine pushes through the muscle? That's the one. It's like this, those tissue layers around the port incision. They're supposed to heal up nice and strong, but sometimes those stitches can weaken or the tissue itself doesn't heal as well, creates a weak spot. And that's when you might get a hernia poking through. Okay, yeah. That's not what you want happening. Can they prevent that at all? Surgeons are really meticulous about closing those port incisions, especially in patients who are at higher risk. Higher risk meaning? Things like obesity, history of hernias, even smoking. Those factors can make a port site hernia more likely, so they'll take extra care. So it's about reinforcing those closures as much as possible. Exactly. Stronger stitches, different techniques, mm -hmm. whatever it takes to make that tissue strong and less likely to give way later on. Makes sense. But what if, despite all that, someone does develop a quartzite hernia after surgery? Then what? Depends. If it's small and not bothering them, they might just keep an eye on it. But often, yeah, it'll need another surgery to fix. Probably better to tackle it sooner than later, I imagine. You got it. Early intervention is key. The good news is fixing a port site hernia is usually less involved than the original surgery. Well, that's something. Okay, changing gears a bit. The podcast also gave some advice for recovering from a laparoscopic appendectomy. Seems like everyone's had their appendix out at some point. It's practically a rite of passage, right? Yeah. And thankfully, with laparoscopy, it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. No more weeks of bed rest and giant scars. Gone are those days. These days, it's all about managing pain, preventing infection, and getting people up and moving as soon as possible. Makes sense. Nobody wants to be laid up longer than they have to be. Exactly. Most folks can head home within a day or two, as long as everything looks good, pain meds, 
maybe some antibiotics, and instructions on how to care for the incision at home. Sounds pretty straightforward. It's amazing how far we've come. It really is. Speaking of advancements, the podcast also touched on laparoscopic adrenalectomy. Adrenalectomy, that's removing the adrenal glands, right? Sounds intense. Can be, yeah. <sighs> but doing it laparoscopically has some big advantages over open surgery. Less blood loss, shorter hospital stay, faster recovery. Same story. So when would they opt for the laparoscopic approach with something like that? Usually it's the go-to for smaller adrenal tumors, less than six centimeters typically, or if they're dealing with what they call functional tumors. Functional, what's that mean? It means the tumor's producing hormones. Mm. And hormones, well, they're powerful stuff. You don't want a tumor messing with your hormone balance. Definitely not. So laparoscopy helps them remove those tumors with less risk, more precision. Exactly. But it's not without its challenges. Those adrenal glands are nestled right up against some major blood vessels, so the surgeon has to be incredibly careful. And with those hormone-producing tumors, blood pressure can be a roller coaster during surgery. Needs close monitoring. Wow, talk about high stakes. But I'm guessing skilled surgeons combined with advanced technology can handle those challenges. Absolutely. It's a testament to how far minimally invasive techniques have come. Speaking of complications, let's touch on something that can affect the gut after abdominal surgery, postoperative ileus. Postoperative ileus, the podcast mentioned it, sounds not pleasant. It's not the most fun side effect, I'll grant you that. Yeah. Basically, it's a temporary paralysis of the intestines. Paralysis, as in they just stop working. Essentially, yeah. It's like your intestines are a conveyor belt, moving food through. After surgery, sometimes that conveyor belt needs a little nudge to get going again. So they take a little break. What causes that? So, like everything else after surgery, they just need a little time to bounce back. But something's got to trigger that slowdown, right? It's a bit of a mystery, honestly. But there are a few likely culprits. The surgery itself can disrupt how the nerves and muscles in the intestines normally work. Anesthesia drugs can play a role, too. Makes sense. Anesthesia messes with a lot of things temporarily. It does. And even some pain medications can make the gut a bit sluggish. So it's like this perfect storm of factors making your intestines want to take a vacation. Pretty much. But obviously we can't just leave them on vacation forever. The good news is getting things moving again is often about strategic rest. Rest. So we fight inactivity with more inactivity. It sounds counterintuitive, but oh. yeah, we basically give the digestive system a total break for a little bit. So easy on the post-op snacks then. Exactly. For a short time, no eating or drinking. They'll get fluids and electrolytes through an IV to stay hydrated. Sometimes they'll use a nasogastric tube. Down the nose into the stomach. That's the one. It helps decompress the stomach, get rid of excess air and fluids, gives the intestines a chance to reset. Not the most appealing image, but hey, whatever works. Right, and it's usually temporary. Plus, it's not just about what they can't do. There are things they encourage to get those bowels moving again. Like what? Give me the magic solution. It's not magic, just good old-fashioned movement. Getting them up and walking around as soon as it's safe after surgery makes a big difference. So that whole walk it off thing actually applies to our insides. You bet. Movement helps stimulate intestinal activity. And of course, managing pain is key. They use pain meds that don't further slow down the gut. Can't have those working against us. Working with the body, not against it. I like that. Okay, one last thing from the podcast, perforated peptic ulcers. Now, this sounded serious. They talked about using laparoscopy in these emergency situations, which seems counterintuitive. When it's that urgent, why not just go in with open surgery? I get where you're coming from. Perforated ulcers, that's a five-alarm fire, surgically speaking. Because you've got a hole in your stomach or duodenum? Exactly. The ulcer, it's like a sore, and when it erodes all the way through, not good. It's an emergency, needs immediate attention. But here's the thing. Laparoscopy lets them get in there quickly, see the damage, and repair the perforation, all with minimal disruption. So even in that kind of crisis, minimally invasive wins out. Often, yes. Yeah. Less trauma means a better chance of bouncing back quickly. Yeah. During the laparoscopy, they find the perforation, often in the duodenum, and they use a special patch. Sometimes it's even a bit of tissue from elsewhere in the abdomen to close the hole. Like patching a tire, but on your insides. That's a good way to put it. And of course, the surgery is just part of it. They'll need antibiotics to fight infection, meds to reduce stomach acid. It's about addressing the whole problem. Getting to the root of it. Exactly. And that's what I appreciate about this whole deep dive into minimally invasive surgery. It's not just about fancy tools and techniques. It's about this holistic view of patient care. From prep to recovery, considering 
everything that affects their well-being. Seeing the whole picture, not just the incision site. Well said. And with technology advancing so rapidly, who even know no s what minimally invasive surgery will look like in 10 years? It's exciting to think about what new tools will they come up with? What will be possible? The possibilities are endless. Definitely a lot to be optimistic about. And on that note, we're wrapping up another episode of The Deep Dive. We've gone deep into the world of minimally invasive surgery today. It's upsides, it's challenges, the real impact it's having. Keep those minds curious, and we'll catch you on our next deep dive.